So one day in the early 1760s, a young man from the city of Hebron, Hebron it's about 40 kilometers south to Jerusalem, arrived in Amsterdam carrying a manuscript in Hebrew he wished to publish. The traveler's name was Mordechai Tama, Tama, T-A-M-A. The manuscript was Midrash Eliezer, interpretative commentary on the book of Exodus that his late grandfather, Rabbi Eliezer Nahum, had written in Jerusalem some 20 years earlier. In the event, Tama's mission failed. Midrash Eliezer was not published until 1999. Nonetheless, Tamar's sojourn in Amsterdam, his participation in literary life and the world of editing, publishing, and the business of the book was one of remarkable achievements. In 1765, he published two major works. Pe'er Ador, in Hebrew means the glory of his generation, an edition of Maimonides' responsa in Tamar's own translation from Arabic into Hebrew, and the second one, Maskiot Kesef, Silver Lockets, a Hebrew glossary by Solomon ibn Meshulam di Piera, a 13th and 14th century scholar in Spain. In this lecture, I would like to examine Tamar's attempts to integrate into the literary milieu of Amsterdam's Judeo-Iberian community. By studying these two publications, Tamar's acceptance into these circles works, worked in two directions. On one hand, adopted his own work to the cultural taste and, and of the Iberian pride of Amsterdam Jews. On the other, his very status as, as an Arabophone gave him a particularly valuable scholarly asset. Tamar, upon arriving in Amsterdam to publish his grandfather's manuscript, Tamar approached his objective by printing a specimen page from the manuscript and the call for funding specifying the readers he had in mind. Clutchers of Torah, Torah is the Jewish divine knowledge, and supporters of its students. And proposing that they subscribe to the edition paying the sum of five florins in advance. Tamar appeals to the clutchers of Torah and supporters of its students for financial assistance in a way he evidently considers acceptable in this cultural world. Since they are clutchers of Torah and supporters of its students, he markets the work by describing its religious virtues in the language of classical traditional literary conventions. However, many subscribers Tamar managed to recruit, it was insufficient. Yet the failure in his first objective did not keep Tamar from pursuing other publishing projects. By studying the two works that Tamar published in Amsterdam in 1765, Pe'er Ador and Maskeot Kesef, we find that during the interval between his failure to publish Midrash Eliezer and his successful publication of, his, of the two works that he managed to publish, Tamar adopted the complex Judeo-Iberian culture that he had encountered in Amsterdam and fashioned his own, his own scholarly persona to both fit in and demonstrate the value of his own expertise as an Arabophone Jew. So, once in Amsterdam, a manuscript of Maimonides', Maimonides response suddenly came into his position. And he undertook to translate and publish it. Tamar introduces Maimonides' response on the title page and in his two page translator's introduction, you can see it here on the right side, using traditional literary conventions, such as the Igbo expression, chemdagnuza, which means a hidden delight, and amon mechuse, which means a hidden educator, to describe the rare book. Maimonides is our great and illustrious rabbi. He depicts Yaakov Sportas, the owner of the manuscript, as a righteous, and milled man filled with the spirit of wisdom of Torah, Tamaz introduces also invokes classical literary convention when it thanks those who help him with his work. May the Lord remunerate him for his deeds and may God bestow blessing upon him and then listed their virtues, including righteous with all good characteristic features, 
trustful in God and so on. But six pages in Spanish follow the Hebrew introduction, constituting public correspondence between the owner of the manuscript, Yaakov Sasportas, and Tama himself. In the text dedicated to Tama, describing the translator's virtues under the title Devidos Elogios con que expresa una pequeña parte de, la, de los muchos que merece el traductor de esta obra, words of price and glory that express a tiny fraction of many prizes that this translator of this work deserves. So Spotas presents Tama as someone whose skills and talents tend to stand to his credit in translating Maimonides' responsa from Arabic into Hebrew. Tama himself lamented on the title page that Arabic used to be a Jewish vernacular language now largely forgotten in the West, and that he himself, the young man from Hebron, held the key to the hidden wisdom that was hidden precisely because the Jews of the West had forgotten their Arabic. For this wisdom, had been hidden for many years. And why? Because Arabic was the language in so many diasporas in Egypt and other places. But since then, many years have passed and no one knows this language. For Saspotas, grandson of an Arabophone Jew from Algeria, also named Yaakov Saspotas, and he was much more famous, the sentiment was personal. He recounts that, he had be, that it had been his grandfather's dream to have the manuscript translated, but the community in Amsterdam had lacked someone like Tama sufficiently fluent in Arabic to do so. In his Spanish responsa to Sasportas, under the title Epistola Dedicatoria del Traductor al Ilustrissimo e Magnifico Senor Jacob Sasportas, follows Sasportas' words, Tama, like in the Hebrew introduction, present the work to the readers. However, whereas in Hebrew, Tama uses classical rabbinical literary convention as he had done when he, when he tried to market his grandfather's book, in the Spanish text, he tailors his description to a different cultural media. One that includes Jewish families of Spanish Portuguese origin who went through significant acculturation and immersed themselves to various degrees in the Christian majority society. In this dedicatory remarks, the terminology is less specifically Jewish and much more universal. Instead of stressing Sasportas' religious virtues and proximity to God, Tama emphasizes his lustre, lustre de la nobleza y el resplandor del ilustre de los merecimientos propios, luster of uh, nobility and his personal virtues and calls him Illustrissimo e Magnifico, e Magnifico Senor. In the Hebrew introduction, the work is described as important because it is rabbinical treatise. Rabbinical terms such as hidden delight and hidden educator are used to drive the point home. In the Spanish, the Jewish law work is described as scientificas consultas y repuestas, scientific question and answer. It deserves to be translated and, and published, Tamar writes, not because it spread the luster of divine knowledge of the Torah among the Jewish people, but para que el mundo, el mundo, not the Jewish world, para que el mundo lograrse los reflujantes rayos del sol escondido debajo de las antipodas de una lengua estranja, because it will, will privilege the world with the splendor of beams from the hidden sun in the mystery of a foreign language, which is of course Arabic. Maimonides too, after being described in the Hebrew text as a giant in Torah, is depicted differently in Spanish. Now he is el más famoso hereo, the most renowned hero, el doctor, and part of los más esclarecidos en la antigüedad en España the most enlightened the family in the history of Spain. These rhetorical differences reflect Tamar's awareness of the cultural diversity of Amsterdam Jewish society and of his, his own potential readership. Both, he realized, are potential readers of the works that he published. This insight left its imprint in the second work that he published in Amsterdam in 17, 
65 מזכיות כסף. Here Tamar resorts to a genre outside the sphere of traditional Jewish teaching, and does so without knowing the author identity. That is, it chooses to redact and publish the work not due to its author virtues, but through an understanding its literary value, either in his own eyes or perhaps in those eyes of the Judeo-Iberian culture circle in Amsterdam. On the title page, Tama acknowledge the author anonymity. This book was found among the rabbinical collection and no one, and no one knows which of those holy men he was. The strengths of the book lie in its contents. It is a river emanating from Eden that waters all of those who thirst. The glossary allows any aspiring writer to enrich and fine-tune his diction and to distinguish among the various meanings of words. For he whose spirit moves, moves him to write, his end will write a mighty, inexhaustible flow and his superb wording will go before him. In this valuable literary, to this valuable literary reference tool, Tama added an appendix. The last six pages of the book comprise the po a poetic correspondence between two medieval Jewish poets, Abraham Badrashi and Tudrus Ibn Yosef Alevi Abulafia. Tama advertised their correspondence on the title page two. Furthermore, ancient words will follow as were written by one of the early ones first among the speakers, our esteemed teacher, teacher and rabbi, Avraham Badrashi, may his memory be blessing, to the great rabbi, prince of the princes of the Levitas, our esteemed teacher and rabbi, Tudus Alevi, may his memory be blessing, a high official and prominent man in the kingdom of Castile, to show the people and the mighty its beauty. In a separate heading on the page at which this correspond correspondence itself begins in the end of the book, Tama added his rationale for included them. I saw fit here to present a writing written by Rabbi Abraham Badrashi, may his memory be blessing, that I consider the embodiment of eloquence. I placed it here because I consider it appropriate. In praising both Bedrashi and Abu Lafia's erudition and their poetic accomplishments, Tama spoke to the cultural values dear to the Spanish Portuguese Jewish milieu he sought to join for which the Judeo-Iberian legacy of rabbinic scholarship and secular poetry were question of at most communal pride. Therefore, although the two books that Tama published in Amsterdam in 1765 belong to different genres, both Maimonides' responsa and the edition of Solomon de Piera's literary reference tool combined with the correspondence of medieval Iberian poets may be included as part of the trend that Irena Zwip from the University of Amsterdam called literary archeology, span manuscript of medieval Sephardi classic, which until then had been hidden in private collection, were now brought to the printing press in order to be saved from oblivion. The title page of Maskiot Kesef already highlighted the word Castile by setting it in bold and large square letters a paratextual appeal to the pride his host community felt in the Iberian heritage. The young man from Hebron's failure to publish his grandfather's rabbinical work did not prevent him from quickly learning the convention and tests of the cultural circle that he encountered in Amsterdam. Tamar's subsequent life in Western Europe, his marriage into an Amsterdam Judeo-Iberian family and his subsequent life in, in France especially in Bordeaux, which lie behind the purview of this lecture, will attest to his success in the cultural integration to which he aspired. Thank you.